All right, I'd like to welcome you to the 2020 Porter Public Lecture here. Um, with our uh, presenter is uh, Raghiv Mahesvan. Uh, Ra Raghiv is CEO of Second Spectrum, a startup, a startup revolutionizing sports to intelligence, pu pushing the boundaries of deep technology to create new forms of interaction, immersion, and personalization. Previously, he served as a research assistant professor in computer science at USC and a project leader at the Information Sciences, Sciences Institute at USC. Raghiv has received numerous awards and has written over 100 publications in artificial intelligence and control theory. Raghiv received a, B, a BS degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and an MS and PhD degrees from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. His work spans data analytics, data visualization, real-time interactions, spatial-temporal pattern recognition, artificial intelligence, decision theory, and game theory. Raghiv. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for taking uh, the time to be here. I, uh, I, uh, that bio sounds familiar. Um, I, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Gerald and J Judith Porter for setting up this lecture. I think it's, uh, I think it's fantastic. Um, I think uh, you know it's always been close to my heart and many people who I know to sort of get math out in there in the world and more and more public. And this is such a great venue to do it, and I appreciate them setting that up. And so I would like to tell you a story. And so there, it has two broad themes. It has themes of mathematics and sports. But it's mostly about people. So I'm going to tell you mostly about people. So I'm just warning you ahead of time. So before we begin, you know, I think when you talk about math and sports, I think we have to acknowledge there's a sort of an elephant in the room, right? There's sort of a caricature of what it means to be in math and be in sports. So, here's a comic. It talks, it characterizes somebody who likes math and somebody who likes sports. And it's a comic by a guy named uh, Marco Racina. I hope I pronounced that right, Marco. Uh, and it's called The Nerd and the Jock. And uh, spoiler alert, they end up being friends. So, um, go read them, they're quite good. But I think it sets up this world, and I agree, it's, it's, a, it's a particularly American point of view, right? I don't, I don't see this dichotomy in other places, but America tells a lot of stories to the rest of the world, so I think it's important to acknowledge that it certainly is quite true here in everything we talk about and in the media that we put out. And so what Marco tries to do is say, look, you're, you're saying we're apart, but what I'm trying to do with my comic is to say we're right next together as friends. And, you know, we might say we're tangent for people in the business. Um, but I want to go beyond being tangent. I want to go to a place where we talk of us being overlapping, being intersecting, and tell you the story of what it means for math and sports to intersect. So, Second Spectrum, as you have heard, is a company that lies at the intersection of math and sports. And Second Spectrum is its people, so I'm primarily going to tell you a story about its people. But there will be some math and sports as well. So, here's the story. A long, long time ago, in a place called Los Angeles, there was a university of Southern California where I was a faculty. And there, I met a fellow faculty named Yuhan. And Yuhan, when he was a kid, liked numbers, and he played a little sports. But he got busy studying, and he went to Harvard, where he studied mathematics and computer science. And then he went to MIT, where he got a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science. And then he came to the University of Southern California, where he taught many, many people, math and computer science. And along the way, he had two children who themselves liked science and math and sports. And Yuhan is a teacher. So Yuhan 
taught his daughter basketball. That was about six years ago. He was also teaching her basketball two days ago. I don't have any evidence of that. But I do have evidence that last night, he was teaching his son basketball. So let's watch him. Very good, very good. Teaching defenses. Yuhan means business. He got a whistle and everything. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to mess with him. But along the way, Yuhan had the misfortune of meeting me. And we decided we liked hanging out, and we started a research group together. And we both liked math and numbers. And we liked people, and we liked fun. And so we decided, as faculty, we were just going to optimize things that were going to live in the intersection of math and fun. So Yuhan liked StarCraft. So one of the first projects we did was build a StarCraft AI bot. I didn't know anything about StarCraft, but now I know what a Protoss is. I like poker, so I made all my students build a poker bot. Uh, it doesn't make for a compelling video. <laughs> Later, we found out that USC had a taxi service for shuttling students around that had GPS markers. So we went and grabbed all of those and see if we could figure out who were the good drivers and the bad drivers from their GPS coordinates. Later on, we found out a bunch of people were tweeting from all over the world and telling people where they were. So we went and grabbed that data and tried to figure out if we can figure out things about cities. Later, we gave our students iPads and made them run around campus. Why? Well, we built a video game. And in that video game, there were zombies all over the USC campus. And if you went and fought them, found them, you could fight them and kill them and get points. But it was a way, in a way, it was actually Pokemon Go three, four years before Pokemon Go came out. Yuhan and I didn't have much of a business sense back then, but we liked numbers and math. And really the reason we did all those things is it was trying to build the science of moving dots. If you notice in all of those things, there were a bunch of entities, whether they were cars, or people, uh, or video game units that were moving around. And we thought it was fascinating. There were all these numbers coming out for the coordinates of all these things, all these moving dots, and said, wouldn't it be fun to build the mathematics and the science of moving dots? And if you're working in the science of moving dots, there's an interesting place where lots of people are moving around. And that happens to be sports. So Yuhan and I got a hold of some sports data, and we wrote a paper for fun at a conference primarily devoted to the intersection of math and sports. And unfortunately for us, or fortunately for us, we won an award, and then we won another award. And the University of Southern California came to us and said, Yuhan, Rajiv, you guys should start a company. And we said, I don't know if you think highly of us, or if you're just trying to get us to leave, but it sounds like fun. So we're going to do it. But when faculty, you can live in the fun of your mind, and when you're going out in the world, you have to help people and build things that real people need. And we were not sure we were capable of doing that. But Yuhan said, I have a friend, and his name's Jeff. And Jeff dropped out of school after his freshman year and taught himself how to program and had spent 15 years becoming what I now know is the most prolific programmer I have ever met, building stuff that took numbers and helped people learn stuff from them. Data, data mining, machine learning. But when Yuhan talked to Jeff about this, he had to convey something to me. Yuhan told me, Rajiv, I think I found the perfect person to be our chief technical officer. Only one thing, he says he doesn't like math. So I was like, I don't know if we can have a company that sits on the intersection of math and sports with a CTO who doesn't like math. But I went ahead because Jeff was clearly brilliant. And then we had him start interviewing people to join us. And his interview questions were, hello student, please find a random line from this file. Please find it when you know how many lines there are. Please find it when you know how many lines there aren't. Find out how, many, how you can do it with constraints on time, with constraints on space. And when I say random, I mean a uniform distribution in case you were thinking of something else. So I was taken aback. But it turns out, even though Jeff did not take a lot of math, 
Jeff was very, very good at math. <laughs> Jeff was very, very good, ma good at math. And Jeff had been very, very good at math for a very, very long time. And not only was Jeff good at math, Jeff was good at sports. So Jeff, while you may not know it, was at the intersection of math and sports. Way to make Justin fall over there, Jeff. So what do two professors and a college dropout do when they start a company? The most responsible thing we can do is convince four of our students to drop out of school and join our company. Now, they were 19, 19, 20, and 21 at the time, which means they were adults. They are all still there. And so off we were at Second Spectrum. And we had an office with a wall full of equations and a ball. But to really understand why there needs to be a company that sits at the intersection of math and sports, you need to go all the way to the beginning. And I mean the beginning of all of us, the beginning of math and the beginning of sports in humankind. So, bear with me. Let's go back to caveman times. All we had was rocks. Thank you, Gary Larson. So people were sitting around playing rock, and they were bored. They were bored out of their minds. And I have it on good authority that there were two cavemen named Grog and Thag. And Gr Thag said to Grog, Grog, I have an idea. Thag, what is it? I said, instead of sitting here holding these rocks or pretending to hold rocks, how about we take small rocks and throw them at that big rock and see if we can hit them? Grog said, that sounds like a fascinating idea. So they started to throw small rocks at a bigger rock. After a while, it grew old. But Thag had an idea. This seems kind of pointless. How about we invent points and see how many times we hit the rock and use counting to see who wins? And Grog said, that sounds fascinating. What's counting? And on that day, both math and sports were invented. Now, I don't know if that's how it happened, but no one can falsify that story. So let's all agree as friends that that's exactly how it started. So Grog and Thag went to the village and taught everybody this game, and they played lots of games with their fellow villagers. And people started to wonder, who was better, Thag or Grog, at throwing rocks at the big rock? Well, Thag had scored more points than Grog. So Thag said he was the best. Grog did not like this and started thinking. And he realized Thag had made poor, more, played more games than Grog. And he said, this must mean something. And Grog invented division. And he said, aha, if I divide points by games, I get points per game. And I score more points per game than Thag, so I am better. Thag did not like this. Thag said, huh, if we're going to count points, why don't we count shots? And said, well, Grog takes more shots than I do. And if you divide points per game by shots per game, Thag invented percentages. And said, I am made at 80% and Grog is at 50%. I am better than Grog. Now, Grog didn't like this because he realized Thag pretty much stood really close to the rocks and just had to just toss them right. And he stood far away for some reason and his shots were much harder. They were way more difficult. But he had no way of showing that, and thus Thag was deemed better than Grog. Now, since then, we know now are playing with rocks and bigger rocks. The rocks have been replaced by these rocks, basketball, soccer balls, footballs, and instead of throwing them into bigger rocks, we throw them into nets and hoops and end zones. So. It gets harder, but instead of throwing rocks, this is what sports, likes look, sports looks like today. Should the Spurs foul? Should Miami go for the three right away? Just attack the basket. James catches, puts up the three. Won't go. Rebound box. Back out to Allen. His three-pointer. Ah! Tie game with five seconds remaining. If you're unfamiliar, that is the rock throwing game known as basketball. Here's another one. 
Yeah, we'll get over the top. Vardy continues his run. The angle is tight. That doesn't matter. Blasting Leicester City. Getting the ball forward quickly, positively, and doing real damage. Jamie Vardy, 2-0. And that is a rock kicking game known as soccer, but only if you're out of the, in, the, in the United States. Everywhere else they call it football. So, the problem still remains because that Ray Allen shot and that Jamie Vardy shot, they were pretty impressive. But were they difficult? Did you expect them to go in? Would they always go in? How hard were they? So since Thag and Grog to Ray Allen and Jamie Vardy, the question of how hard it was still remained. The problem was, we did not have any numbers. We didn't have enough numbers. We had numbers, but they were THAG numbers. And basically, sports and sports numbers have been THAG numbers since the rock throwing days. But now, a lot of progress has been made. One of the things that has happened is big advances in computer vision. And what I mean by that is, a computer can see. A computer can see the game. All the aspects of the games, the players, the court, the ball, and figure out where they are all the time. So a little bit about how that happens. So a computer looks at a piece of video and says, find me something that's circular. And it looks at a circle. There's a circle. And there's another circle. Now, I don't mean to imply Chris Bosch's head is a circle. Um, I need an example. I'm sorry, Chris. And computers make mistakes. But let's say that's called detection. So it'll detect circles. It can also detect the colors. And it'll say, OK, find me the circles that are orange and say, ah, I think that's the ball. And then for that same moment, it takes a different angle and says, find me some circles and find me an orange circle. And I think, hey, I've got two different places where I can see a ball that is orange. And then who is holding that ball? Well, you can find blobs of white and see if they're Miami and maybe find a 34 and see if that's Ray Allen and then you triangulate. And you will find Ray Allen and his teammates and his opponents and the ball for every frame of video where you have two cameras. You can do the same thing for Jamie Vardy. You find the ball, you find a blue patch, you find a ball, you find another blue patch, and you find Jamie Vardy and the ball. Now, it gets a lot more complex than that. If you have any questions, this is Frederick. Frederick likes soccer. Frederick would say he likes football because Frederick is from Denmark. And when Frederick was 17, he was on the FC Copenhagen under 17 team. FC Copenhagen is one of the best, if not the best team in, in Denmark. Frederick is also a computer vision engineer that helps figure out where balls and soccer players are. With his work and the work of many, many people like him, we can turn sports athletes and the ball into what we all love, moving dots. Now I know those are circles, but the dots are at the center of the circle. And what this does is for games like basketball, football, hockey, and we've done this for tennis, beach volleyball, a whole bunch of other sports, we've turned and generated massive, massive piles of numbers, coordinates, for every frame of video of sports played around the world. And we've sort of gone orders of magnitude into the raw material of what we know about sports. Now the question is, what should we do with all these numbers? Well, there's a great number of things we can do. First thing we do, solve Grog's problem. So Grog always knew. I knew it was hard. I could tell you why it was hard, but I needed the information to tell me why it was hard. Well, in basketball, people can tell you why something is harder and not hard. You can take a look and say, hey, if I'm taking a shot at the basket, how far away is it? What angle to the basket am I? Are there people near me? What angle are they? Are there more than one person near me? What, how am I planning on throwing the ball into the hoop? Am I moving? There's many, many things. and with machine learning and a whole bunch of other mathematical techniques, there's a way for us to very accurately predict what the chances of any shot going in are. So we can say, hey, for anybody holding a ball anywhere, 
we have a lot of information to say we can make a pretty accurate prediction of how likely that ball is to go in. So here's how that illuminates us. So if you look at the last three years and sort of people who've shot the ball a lot, this is the ranking of the top 10 players and how often they can sort of accurately shoot rocks at the big rock. Now, some of them shoot slightly bigger rocks and they're worth more, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. But basically, these are all very, very good players and nobody would say they weren't. But nobody would really say, even Rudy and Clint, that they're the best shooters in the NBA. And the reason is they know that if you looked at how hard the shots they were, were taking, most players could make those shots. Now, credit to them for being able to get those shots, but they are shots that most people would be able to make. Now, because we're able to figure out what an average person would do, or not an average NBA player would do with these shots, we can take that number and the thing they actually shoot and use this thing called subtraction and get the impact of the shooter. The difference between what happens and what we expect to happen. And that illuminates us because we see Rudy Gobert gets fantastic quality shots and he converts them pretty well. A person like Steph Curry converts way higher than expected. And you can see there's sort of a category of people who shoot way higher and people who shoot well. Now, even the players who are in yellow are fantastic players and most players, most teams would want to have them, but nobody would call them the best shooters in the NBA. But if we rank by impact, suddenly we get a list that is much more aligned with what people who study the game without numbers say are the best shooters in the NBA. So this, all these numbers actually help math and sports come together. Now, an aside, it turns out three of the four of those players, three of those players at the top happened to play for the same team for a while, and a couple of those players on the bottom also played on the same team for a while, and they all were quite successful, and if you watch the NBA Finals, those are the only players you saw for a long, long time. If you have questions, this is Matt. Matt had an undergraduate degree in MIT from computer science, he studied machine learning, and he builds all the models like the shot probability model along with a team of people. Matt was also an MIT basketball captain. Here is Matt playing basketball. Matt is six foot ten and can jump very high. But if you look underneath it, what is Matt is trying to show you is that these shots are very, very easy. They're close to the basket and no one is around him. They're high quality shots. Matt is putting it in with a little extra bit of theatrical flair, but he's basically telling you, I know how to get high quality shots. Unfortunately, Matt is not missing because sometimes people miss shots. And if you miss shots, you still want to get the ball back. So let's go back to our Ray Allen video and see what happens when somebody misses a shot. James catches, puts up the three. Will go, rebound, box. So when somebody misses a shot and you get the ball back, it's called a rebound. And just like shooting rocks at a bigger rock, you can count the number of rebounds people get. And you can have fag metrics Let's say, how many rebounds did you get? How many rebounds did you get per game? How many rebounds? What percentage of rebounds did you get? But rebounding is part of a continuous process. Somebody shoots the ball, it clangs off the rim, people try and get close to it, and somebody eventually ends up with the ball. And you really don't know how many rebounds a person is expected to get. If somebody says, I get 10 rebounds a game, maybe you just hung out by the rim the whole time. Does it really tell me anything? because you could be positioned very, very close to the basket, or if you're not, you could run around and try and get to the ball, and once you get to the ball, you can actually get the ball in your hands. These are three different and distinct skills. All are valuable, but the problem is by counting what only we see, we don't really get to what's important there. So, let's see if we can use a little mat to help us out there. So, with numbers, we can say, look, if somebody shot the ball from that little orange square, we can count all the places where the ball lands, 
right? So it's just, it's a spatial distribution of, of the ball landing conditioned on where the shot was taking. Now, if you don't understand that, it's all nothing but fancy counting, right? And so if you can get this data, you can pretty much say, what if the shot was taken here? Well, that's where the ball will go. What about here? Well, that's where the ball will go. What about here? That's where the ball will go. What about here? That's where the ball will go. So we can tell where the ball will go because we have numbers that show it. What about what space we should own? Well, there's a thing called Voronoi tessellation, or Dirichlet tessellation, or a Thiessen polygon, or a bunch of math that shows this. But this is just a fancy way of saying, I get all the space that's close to me. So if the two of us are had a particular distance and I draw a line between us, I should be closest to all those points, and she should be closest to all the points on the other side. And there's another line, and there's lines between every single person who is a dot. All that says is the light green person is closer to all the, the light green stuff, and the pink person is closer to all the pink stuff. Not very complicated. Well, what we can do with that is look at where all the players are standing, give them their Voronoi cells, look at where the ball is, see where the ball is going to land, and see if we can merge them together. And what that means is saying, if I want to figure out the chance of that player on the upper right getting a rebound, if we were all the same and we were all equally talented and could move in any direction, I should be able to get to all the space that's closest to me. And all I have to do is add the numbers in the polygon on the right and divide by all the numbers on the right-hand side, and I have a percentage. And if we were all the same, that is the percentage that I should get. Now, some people will get more than others. So we should not expect everybody to get the same. Now, another thing you might ask is, well, the ball and the players are moving. Well, all those things can move as well. The Voronoi tessellations can move with every single frame. The spatial distribution can move with every frame. So for every moment in time, we can tell how much each person should get. And we can take all of that and create an expectation of how many rocks people should catch. And from that, we can do the same thing. We can say, here are the players the, of the top 50 players or so who were able to sort of get rebounds over the last three years. These are the ones who got the highest percentage. But we can find some other metrics that explain why. Now, the numbers aren't going to add up. So they're fancier math, math metrics that don't make them, try and make them add up. You'll give yourself a headache, or not. But we can look at somebody like Clint, Rudy, and Carl. They both get about, all get about 20% of the rebounds, but they do it in very different ways. Rudy has a 21 in positioning, and he stands close to the basket. He doesn't convert as well. Carl is six, five or six points less and converts way higher, and Clint is somewhere in the middle. Interestingly, if you rank by conversion, you will end up getting a lot of the best players in the NBA. And so it's interesting because there are all these advanced numbers can reveal things about how great players can reveal themselves. There's a lot more that you can do. Sports is not just numbers. Sports is a lot of words. So here's a basketball play with lots of words that people using, uh, that playing, uh, who know the game well will use to describe the game. So we've got whips and flares and drops and all kinds of things that I actually don't understand, but with machine learning, we can teach a machine to understand all these worlds, leverage these numbers, and get machines to understand these words as well as the best human on the planet. We can do the same thing for football. You can ask a question that says, who are the players who target near the passes near the box from pro progression to attacking phase, bypassing three defenders with the highest completion percentage above expectation. Now, when we started working in football, I pretty much understood that first four words. <laughs> but luckily for me, the machine and all the people working understand the rest and are able to answer the question. And what you can get by asking questions like these is really get some of the best passers in the, in, in the English Premier League. So the numbers have a way of revealing what people know in their hearts, people who've been around sports a long, long time, and the intersection grows. If you want to know how we do this, let me introduce you to Tracy. Tracy did an undergrad at MIT, and 
a PhD at MIT in electrical engineering and computer science. Then she was a professor at Caltech in the computational and mathematical sciences and founded two companies where she was her CTO. In her spare time at MIT, Tracy was also an athlete. In fact, many people, even people at Sex Spectrum, don't know this, but Tracy is the only national champion we have. And she is a national champion in the women's air pistol. That's right, the pistol. When you're working in machine learning in sports, people question you a lot about things like speeds and distances and trajectories. We never question Tracy about speeds and distances and trajectories. She knows what she's doing. And I asked her, how do I explain to all these people what we do to make all these words and numbers appear? And she gave me a bunch of words. Now, I'm not going to go into those words for you, because some of them are too hard to explain, and some of them I don't know. But if, you're, if, if you don't know them, don't worry. It's all just fancy counting. This is Horesh. Horesh leads our computer vision. He did a PhD in computer vision at one of the top computer vision labs in Switzerland. And he was very fortunate to do his entire PhD thesis on sports. Yep, take your eyes off the ball, focus on team play, tracking multiple people, tracking more people. Very lucky, and we were very lucky to find him. We asked Horesh, tell me, how do I tell everybody how, what we do? And he gave me a bunch of words. And I can't, I'm not going to go into all of them. You can look them up. Again, it's nothing more than fancy counting. But the key thing is, look, we're extracting lots of interesting information. Can we use this information to inform people? Can we go and tell people how to better understand the game? Can we not just analyze, can we create? Can we use numbers and data and algorithms, machine learning, AI, computer vision, to actually change what people see, to inform them, to make them more engaged and more understanding? And the answer is yes. So we worked very hard for a number of years to change the way we tell stories about sports. So let's go back to that Ray Allen video. Take everything we know about shot probability and rebound probability and tell that story with numbers. Should the Spurs foul? Should Miami go for the... Just attack the basket. James catches, puts up the three. Look at that Jamie Vardy goal again. So the numbers not only just sort of inform us, but they, they let us know how much more is going on in the sport. And I find myself going deeper and deeper into the sports because I understand it more. The more you understand something, the more you love something, and the more you love something, the more you want to understand it. And it's such a virtual cycle. And we found it incredibly rewarding to create these things. I want to show you another clip from the Premier League from about 20 years back. Dancing again, back to Kivomia. There's Marshall, gonna connect. Oh, it's two, this time it's Palmer. And oh, that's an absolutely cracking goal. Two goals in three minutes for Ipswich Town. And that time, Steve Palmer from the edge of the Old Penalty area, the right footed drive on the volley, in off the post, two. That's Steve Palmer. Steve Palmer plays for Ipswich Town. 
and a bunch of other teams. There's his card. Steve Palmer not only played in the Premier League, but before he played in the Premier League, he went to Cambridge, where he got a degree in software engineering. So Steve Palmer went to Cambridge, got a degree in software engineering, and played in the Premier League. He's doing neither of those things now. I guess he got bored of being so excellent. But what Steve Palmer is doing now is working for the Premier League and making sure that the Premier League uses as much technology as possible, as well as possible, to try and make sure that we understand the game, promote the game as well as we can. And it's very rare to find a person as unique as him being able to do that. Here is Steve Palmer today. That was last August. He was there on the opening week of the Premier League and the opening day to make sure we did our jobs, counting everything accurately. Because the idea is that once we count everything, once we track everything, once we learn everything, we will have to transform every piece of sports content to be personalized to every single person on the planet. And it could look something like this. Math and sports come together, beautiful things can happen. And we're only scratching the surface. It's only the tip of the iceberg. We're at a precipice of fantastic things happening in the future at the intersection of math and sports. But you know, as I find myself sort of standing here talking to all of you about math and sports, I, I, you know, I question, how, how did I end up here? How did I end up here sitting at the intersection of math and sports to do things I love dearly? And so you know, I went back, and I, I sort of started looking looking at pictures of myself and other people when I was a kid. It turns out, and I didn't find out, most of what I'm going to tell you I've found out very, very recently. So, it turns out when I was a kid, I was always with a ball, even before I could walk. And when I was at the Second Spectrum offices, I was always with the ball. And when they let me, they let me on the court and I was with the ball. And it wasn't always basketball. I was the goalie for a football team that was undefeated for three years. Had nothing to do with me. The team was really good. I barely had to do anything. Um, I also tried the other football. That's me running in the snow. Just to let you know, I scored a touchdown there. Um, but I don't know how I came to sports, so I went even sort of further back. It was a love that built up in me just the way the love of math built up in me since I was a kid. So what was I like as a kid? Well, there's me and my sister and my mom. And that's me and my sister and my dad. And it turns out, I knew this. My dad was a math teacher. But that's pretty much most of what I knew about him for most of my life. But it turns out, and I found this story out in drips and drabs over the years, because he would never tell me anything. He, re in fact, abjectly refused to tell me anything because he wanted to find my own way. And he wanted to find me to find the way to whatever I loved. So whenever I asked him advice about classes or hobbies, he would be like, it's all you. But what I found out was, when he was a college age student, he won a really prestigious prize and went to Cambridge at Churchill College, where he studied mathematical astrophysics in the 60s with some very interesting people. And then he came back and he taught mathematics for decade after decade after decade after a decade. And it made sense because his students kept visiting us and thanking him. And I didn't realize it was decades of teaching math. I, I knew a caricature of that, but I didn't know the whole story. What I had no idea about was, when he was also in college, he was actually quite the rugger player. 
Apparently there were lots of sports clippings of him, uh, articles about him in the newspaper and sort of the, the Royal Trinity rugger match was the big, big match of the day. But not only did he play rugger all through college, he coached. While he was teaching mathematics, he was teaching rugby to students year after year, decade after decade. But he let me find my own way. I, I don't think it's genetic. I just think, well, it could be. I can't lie. It's, it's pretty close. But he had no influence on me. He let me find my own path. And I think that's quite important. I found what I, lo what I loved, and it happened to track him. This is a few weeks ago, his 80th birthday. The family had gotten a little bigger. Three kids. That's my oldest daughter. She likes science and art. Two days ago, she had her first basketball practice. Um, I'm not Yuhan, so I didn't really teach her that much. I pretty much told her, don't bounce the ball with two hands and let her go. That was her first practice. This morning, a few hours ago, she played her first basketball game ever. Unfortunately, I was not there to see it because I wanted to be here with all of y'all. But my wife sent a video of her a couple of hours ago. And here she is. She's the eight there in the back. There we go. Lollygagging in the back. Whoa, whoa. Good position, lucky position. A little bit of traveling. There we go. Bang! <laughs> That's like the fourth time I've seen it today. It still gets me. Look, she might not end up liking sports. She might not end up liking science or math or art. But the key thing that I'm going to tell her is like, it doesn't matter. Don't separate them. They're all the same. They are more together than they are apart. In fact, if you look at the work that we have done and the work that I've shown you, it is the integration of math and science and sports and art all in the same thing. You see that in the Vardy video. You see that in the Ray Allen video. And in fact, our vision is everything should integrate everything for everyone because it's all the same. And it doesn't matter if you're Ray Allen or if you're us playing a pickup basketball game, it should be the same. And so we were playing a pickup basketball game shortly after the Ray Allen shot, trying to mimic it. Now, it was a bunch of us in an outdoor gym in Chinatown in Los Angeles. We put up three girl pros on sticks and tried to track our basketball game. But there's no reason why our game shouldn't be just as good as Ray Allen in the NBA Finals. So here's what that looks like. Shibani goes for the three right away. Just attack the basket. James catches, puts up the three. Won't go. Now that wasn't Ray Allen, that was Daria. Now, by some luck, Daria happens to be sitting right here right now. Everybody give Daria a hand. <laughs> Daria was a freshman at USC when she wanted to join our research group. Daria did not know much about, much about math or sports, but she had drive and she said, she cut together a video of basketball I'm not sure, using iMovie or something. And it showed grit. And we, she joined our research group. She was an intern at Second Spectrum. And now she's a fantastic software engineer out there giving talks all over the place. Also, she has a mean jump shot. But she's not the only one at Second Spectrum with a mean jump shot or with athletic prowess. This is Lily. Lily does Brazilian martial arts. Jeez. Jeez indeed. This is Mike. Mike is also an MIT basketball captain. Mike would like Matt to know he could also dunk a basketball. This is Ryan. 
He is also an MIT basketball captain. And Ryan would like both Mike and Matt to know. You know, he's still working on it. He's got time. He's a young man. Uh, this is Zach. Zach played football at Columbia. This is Cameron. Cameron's saying, hey, I'm an MIT basketball captain too. This is Cordelia. Cordelia fences. Between Tracy and Cordelia, we feel quite safe. <laughs> this is Lisa, she plays tennis. This is Grant, he played rugby. This is Mary, she swam. This is Nacho, he played soccer. This is Ryan, he also played basketball. This is Sam, he apparently rode. This is Samarth, even though he's holding a basketball, he didn't play basketball. He did crew and cricket. This is Tim, he's holding a basketball and he played basketball. This is Anthony, he's not holding a basketball, but he does play a basketball. This is Nicole, she swims. This is Cindy, she plays basketball. That's Dave, he played football, the American football in the NFL. This is Tim, he plays basketball. This is another Tim, he plays football. He played in the NFL. This is Ivan, he plays soccer. This is Ethan, he played soccer in the MLS. This is Julian, he plays basketball. Justin played baseball. Kelly has two basketballs, she plays basketball. Kenny's holding a basketball, he played volleyball in college. Kwame is not holding a basketball, he played basketball semi-professionally. This is Noel, he's holding a basketball and football. He played football in college. This is also Noel, he's holding nothing. He was also an MIT basketball captain. Sabrina's holding a basketball, she was also an MIT basketball captain. This is Vec, he played cricket. Almost everyone I showed you is an engineer and has some mathematical training. But not everyone, and it shouldn't matter. It really should not matter. Because you do not have to be good at math to love math, and you do not have to be good at sports to love sports. It is important that the love is there, because where there's love, there's learning. You know, there's a lot of places where there are numbers in the world. A lot of numbers in the world. Finance, health, nutrition, math classes. In almost all of them, no one wants to look at these numbers, including myself. But there's one place, sports, where no one is afraid of a decimal point. In fact, not only are they not afraid, they lean in. And in living rooms, and in parks, and in arenas, and restaurants here and around the world, people are talking about sports and they're talking about numbers. They're talking about counting and dividing and percentages and difficulty and quality and expectation and what better place to learn and love math. You know, I've always wanted to teach. Yuhan is a teacher, Jeff is a teacher. We embrace learning. And what better place than to use the love of sports, the connectivity of sports, than to teach math? So, a few years ago, we built a software tool that connected art and math and sports and connected to a STEM program. And here's what happened. Oh, I'm sorry, where's that? Let me try that again. Who is the real MVP? Who is the most valuable player? Let's look at the numbers. This is the story of a smart three-point shooter. This is the story about LeBron, the hoop master. He has a field goal percentage of 52%. LeBron has made 119 three-pointers. Expect him to take more shots in the paint. Not only does Stephen Curry use physical advantage, he also uses intelligence to become one of the best NBA players. LeBron shot over 1,000 shots in the paint for 64%.
you know, if you love math, there's a lot in sports to love. It is one of the most complete and congruent manifestations of mathematics in the world. And if you love sports, you may not know it, but you love math. Um, but it's, it's not about math and sports. Even though they were conceived apart, becoming tangent, and intersecting, it is not about math and sports. It is about love, it is about learning, it is about people. It's always about people. It's about people, it's about people, it's about people, it's about people, it's about people. It's about people. Because at the end of the day, we are all in it together. Thank you very much, everybody. We have some uh, time for some questions. Any questions? There are some mics on the side that you can come up to. Hello? Hello. It seems to me that today sports has expanded into the realm of video games. And it seems that you should be able to take your same technology that you're using for sports, apply them to video games, and for these competitive games, design a bot that could absolutely dominate the video game world. Look, I think, look, I think you said a lot of things that, that both are happening and it's true. So I think, you know, video games and sports are two of the most compelling things out there. And I think a lot of people think that's a bad thing. So we certainly think it's a good thing. I think before we got into sports, Johan and I had a, had a, had a very, a proposal that we really cared deeply about to basically use video games as a vehicle to help learning. But you're putting, putting the fun first and the teaching second. So we really believed in that. We believe about the same thing in sports. And together, we're actually trying to bring it together. If you look at what we're doing, we're trying to turn sports into a video game. We're trying to bring everything we learned about video games into sports and use that engagement that people have with sports and, and video games, which are natural manifestations of mathematics, to, to really find a way to get people to learn math, because I think the key thing is love has to come first. Love comes first, then learning comes second. Now, on the technical side, it's super interesting what computers have been able to do. I think I've been, we've been, I, I've been in AI for a while. You know, we saw, uh, you know, poker players. We saw Go being beaten. Uh, we've seen uh, very recently. There's been uh, StarCraft has been done really well. And I think you know computers are going to get better and better. But I think that's a good thing because I think it's not our job to compute, compete compete with computers, our, our job is to engage with each other, and computers are just a vehicle to help us get there faster. So, thank you. Hi. Very nice presentation. How do you pay for all this? How do you pay for all this? So, I think that the, one of the best things we have to do, and I think when we started the company, our, one of the most important things we said is, we are not going to do what would be fascinating at, for us as professors we are going to do something that will make someone else happy. So we went out and we said, we talked to coaches and players and managers and league officials and broadcasters and fans and we said, what would make you happy? And when you make things that make other people happy, it turns out they will often compensate for you, <laughs> compensate you for that happiness and you can use that money to build other ways to make people happy. So who are your customers? So we, all the people I mentioned, so we, we partner, almost every single NBA team works with us. We work, we have the official partner of the NBA, of the Premier League, uh, uh, we'll be soon uh, launching with Major League Soccer. Uh, we work with ESPN, we've been on national broadcast there. So basically, if you're in the sports ecosystem and you do something sort of, we work with a lot of the top tier people who are trying to change the way sports is presented. So no, those are our customers. First of all, I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. And I have one question. How do you guys integrate the skill of the player 
uh, into the probability that they'll make a goal or make a three-pointer. How do you integrate the skill of the player into the probability? So actually, we're trying to solve the inverse problem. We know that the player is skillful. And I think a lot of people, the reason a lot of people had problems with math and sports is you're giving me a number that does not accurately reflect how skillful this player is. So if I came and told you, you know, Rudy Gobert is a better shooter than Steph Curry, even Rudy Gobert would say, what? You know, but I think what we're trying to do is actually create metrics that actually reflect skill. And skill is a complex thing to understand because it has more dimensions and more complexity. But I think that's, that's the rabbit we're chasing. Can we actually find numbers and words that actually properly reflect the skill that all the people playing sports have? Thank you. Thank you. Is there another one? Really enjoyable presentation. Thank you. Uh, your theme about it's about people, I think, is a very uh, moving one and very important one. Uh, but I'm going to get a little technical, not very technical. Um, one of the things that there's this uh, uh, book about Moneyball where yep. data has changed the way people uh, select players. And I know in history, uh, formations in international football have changed generally not by uh, data. The ones I know are not by data, but they're much more uh, somebody comes up with a good idea. And I was wondering if there have been any really changes in the way that you get formations uh, or style of play that have come out of the kind of analysis that you've done. Uh, I, the, go ahead. Uh, right, so, I, that's it. Absolutely. So even in like the very first year of the, uh, you know, an, an NBA owner called and said, hey, I just traded for a guy that uh, you, you that because of the number that you said, it's like, oh, oh God, I was like, oh God, I hope that number's right. And, and uh, he turned out he did what, what we, we said he would do. And that has been happening a lot uh, where people sign trade players based on stuff that we have created. Uh, on the strategy side, we, we, I have stories I cannot tell about teams who have changed their strategies in the NBA finals that have led to them winning based on information that we have given them. but. I'm sworn to secrecy, you know, until I get a little bit older and don't care. But uh, I definitely know that, uh, that that stuff has happened. It happened very, very early. Because I think that's the beautiful thing about sports is that everybody really cares. Everybody really cares about winning. And th they will shun you if you speak nonsense. But if you bring something of value, people will listen. And people, even the chance of bringing something of value, people will listen. And if there's something of value, they will use it right away. And that is what makes it so compelling because everybody, everybody cares so much. In fact, you know, to be, to be frank, I've never had more, I, I was a professor for a very long time. I gave a lot of talks to classrooms and, and conferences. And I have never, ever, ever even have come close to have a more engaged and compelling audience as when I'm talking to people who are sports fans. So it's, 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 it's really quite rewarding. Yep, thank you. Um, I have a question and related to somebody who is an expert in sports and maybe sir, you hear people talk about the eye test, right? Yep. So people who are experts in sports sort of say, I already know everything I need to know. Your numbers aren't going to tell me anything I don't already know. Do you have any stories about having changed somebody's mind of actually um, of being able to get over that hurdle of someone who says, I think I already know everything I need to know. Your math isn't actually going to help me. And I, so we've had to go through that. But I think the most important thing to, to do is to acknowledge that the eye test is really almost often the best thing. So we've been sort of, as people have been around for hundreds of thousands of years observing multidimensional features of each other. And so almost always, the human eye at a small sample size has the most information. Where machines can help is basically it can do things at scale that people can't. So for example, the NBA, an NBA coach watching a bunch of film about players is probably going to know more about than a computer. But a computer can watch every frame of video from every single game all the time that a, that a human can't do. Now, how do you convince a coach? Well, I think what you do is you prove yourself. You say, hey, this thing that you have learned this thing also learned and test it to make sure it has learned the thing that you think is right. 
And once you do that, then I will let you talk about that particular dimension. So it's, it's like you talking to another human being about something you're an expert in. Prove to me you know the subject matter, and once you, once you know the subject matter, I will trust you on that subject matter. And that is the process, and that is the right process, and that is the fair process, and we've been going through that process for, for many, many years, and it has been proved successful. But I think the bar to prove yourself over the eye test should be there, and it should be overcome, and that's the job of people who work in numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds good. Go ahead. Okay, you have a very compelling feel-good story. But on the darker side of it, what uh, safeguards are you putting in place to prevent your technology, your knowledge, from being used in a more socially controversial area like sports gaming, sports gambling? I see. So, look, I think what we are doing is doing nothing more than what people are already doing with their eyes. Right, so we're not doing, everything that we are generating is observable by the human eye. Right, so like, we're, we're not you know, extracting anything from the flares and what you, a human could see at a stadium on television. So uh, you know, to the degree that a self-driving car is trying to see the same way a human driver can see, um, uh, the, what we're doing is just basically trying to do the same thing for sports. Now, certainly in sports gaming, uh, you know, there's, a, there's value to information, you know. And uh, for me, that, that doesn't have to necessarily do with having information, it has to do with having asymmetrical information, right? So if everyone has symmetrical information, it's a fair game. And asymmetrical information is where, where people get into trouble. And I think that's not, I don't think that's, for us, we are creating information. I think it's important that whatever, the way information gets out there, you know, there's a symmetry to it, there's a synchrony to it, and that, that's really the issue with gaming, not, not the fact that there is information. And I think I'm always a fan of having more information. How the information is distributed, shared, yes, that, that's something we should talk about, how that should be fair to everyone the, and to all the stakeholders. All right, thank you. Yep. How's it going? Really, Good. Really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. So I was wondering about how, um, in pretty much every professional sport, uh, different scenarios depending on uh, clock management, end of quarters, end of halves, end of games, uh, oftentimes the numbers can get skewed by strategies. So for example, um, a team that's down by a lot of points in, in an NFL game might start throwing the football more, and that could tell you that it's a prolific passing team, or, yeah. or in the NBA, if a team is down big, they'll start shooting more, and so that'll throw off their numbers, and it gives you a different idea of than, than what these players are actually capable of doing. So does your analysis uh, account for um, situations that would make things look different than what they ordinarily would be? Absolutely, I think that's the entire point of what we're trying to do, is because what you're saying is, look, and this is what coaches and managers tell us, you don't understand because you don't know the context of the situation. Right. Every situation has different context. And our answer is, you're absolutely right. We're gonna go learn that context. We're gonna learn that that was a transition, that was a press, that was an attack, that was a buildup, that was a blitz, that was a, uh, that was a, you know, uh, a wide pin. And so, Everything we're use, using machines to do is not tell people what to do, but learn context so that people can ask those questions and machines can help with answer, asking those questions. But the entire point is that people always want context. They are unable to get as much context as they can because the only way to collect information before was with people and that only scales so much. And now we're just enabling people who want context to get much more context and answer those questions. Appreciate it, thank you. <clears throat> Have you, uh, how, how well do these techniques uh, apply to one-on-one uh, -on -one sports? I would think because there are fewer people, fewer variables, uh, for example, like tennis, and have you applied them, and are you working with any pros? So we're not working in tennis right now, much to the chagrin of our CTO, um, but, uh, but I think, it, I think we, can, we can definitely look at one-on-one -on -one matches. So even within you know, sp sports uh, like uh, basketball, football, soccer, you know, there are times when there's people going one-on-one, -on -one, both on offense and defense, and within those contexts when there's one-on-one, -on -one, we do a lot of analysis to help 
uh, uh, figure out those situations. So even if the sport was entirely those situations, there's a lot of information that can be extracted. So I don't think, you know, uh, you know I think as long as there's two rocks and a bigger rock, we can do something. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and there's points and we're counting uh, because that just actually gives you a metric and accountability. And so certainly I think this can be applied to tennis, to one-on-one -on -one basketball, to all kinds of things. And we've seen that. And, and not just us, but there are many, many people doing this all over the world. Thank you. One more. Okay, yeah, I was wondering, uh, taking that one step further, whether you've thought about this for individual things, like you mentioned that you had a swimmer or runners or archery shooting, yeah. that kind of stuff. I mean, the similar techniques, can they apply? No, absolutely. So that, I mean, we just happened to focus on, on basketball and football because, you know, we thought, you know, it's the two biggest sports on the planet. You can, you know, can throw a dart uh, <laughs> on, a, on a globe and, you know, with an tens of miles somebody's playing one or, the, one or the other. But certainly I think there are, this is a, a general thing, you know, a sort of data, computation, machine learning, artificial intelligence. This is going, and you can see this, it's, it's everywhere in your life. It's not just one sport, it's all sports. It's driving, it's directions, it's fo your photographs. You know, uh, you know, just like, you know, finding highlights is just like, I can find highlights in a game I'm watching as a fan, and I can hopefully one day find highlights of my daughter playing basketball. Right now, you know, <laughs> hopefully there'll be more than one as time goes on. But I think the idea is that this is going on everywhere in every context, and we just we're happy to move the world forward in our little in our little piece of it. So, thanks. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for your time. <laughs>